avait sans doute une notion d'affection entre Léonard et le roi. C'était devenu le Giorgio Lucas du Quattrocento. La mort de Léonard de Vinci dans les bras du roi de France, François Ier, c'est une fiction. Welcome to a new edition of France in Focus. I'm Nadia Shabi, and this, as you may recognize, is Leonardo da Vinci. The why, you may ask, is his likeness on the banks of the River Loire. Well, you may be surprised to hear that Italy's most famous artist and inventor ended his days here in the region of Amboise. And before we hear more about that, let's find out why and how he came to France. The year is 1516, and at the age of 64, Leonardo da Vinci is in the winter of his life. His reputation as an artist and thirst for scientific knowledge are well established, both at home and abroad. But in Rome, under Pope Leo X, the Italian genius of all geniuses is unable to find a new patron. Da Vinci's work on anatomy is raising eyebrows, as are rumours of his alleged homosexuality. So an invitation from a young French king couldn't come at a better time. Art-loving regent Francis I is just 20 years old, but he fully grasps the significance and prestige of the old man's accomplishments and wants them at the service of his own court. So, after some hesitation, da Vinci sets out on what will be his final trip, a gruelling two-month trek on the back of a mule. By his side are his two assistants, Francesco Melzi and Gian Caprotti, a.k.a. Salai, and tucked inside his bags, three unfinished paintings, St. John the Baptist, St. Anne, and, of course, the Mona Lisa. Leaving Rome, the three men cover an average of 50 kilometers every day and cross into France through the Col du mont -Senis in the Alps. Once the city of Lyon behind them, the end of the road is finally in sight, the royal castle of Amboise, where King Francis awaits. And da Vinci was no doubt welcomed here with all the pomp and ceremony he deserved. In fact, the site is still imbued with the master's exceptional aura, inspiring painters such as famed Italian street artist Andrea Ravo Mattoni. But getting back to da Vinci's relationship with the king, I've come to meet the director of the Chateau of Amboise, Jean-Louis Sureau. Jean-Louis Sureau, hello. Hello. Thank you for welcoming us here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the King's vision, why he was interested in da Vinci, who already actually had a relationship with France? France's kings were captivated by what they witnessed at the courts of neighboring Italy. And because da Vinci was already a very famous artist, even before King Francis, his predecessor, Louis XII, had himself attempted to lure Leonardo to France and had purchased some of his works. It's chiefly as an artist that they sought da Vinci's talents. Leonardo was a kind of celebrity whose prestige allowed France to shine internationally. So getting Leonardo da Vinci to France was a bit of a, a political victory. It was a form of soft power, which arguably contributed towards making France Europe's most powerful kingdom at the time. Not just on the military front, but also as a cultural and intellectual power, and as such, a place where artists could thrive. And what do we know of the two men's relationship? Well, obviously, their relationship wasn't one of equals, but the king did hold the artist in especially high regard. And he used the term my father when talking to him, a sign of how much he valued him, and even perhaps of the sentimental nature of the two men's bond. So what did the king expect of da Vinci in exchange for his patronage? When da Vinci lived here in Amboise, he was a very old man, yet that did not stop him from being really active. Of course, up until the very end, he carried on working and perfected his paintings. But he also continued to learn, taking notes, drawing, sketching. We have all these traces of his insatiable curiosity. And it wasn't only art, he also designed events, celebrations. 
It's a lesser-known aspect of da Vinci's work, but he's already experimented in Italy, most notably at the court of Milan. And in the spring of 1518, right here in Amboise, Leonardo oversaw celebrations that lasted several weeks, which made him something of the party planner of the French court. He had great taste, imagination, originality, all the things that epitomize the Renaissance. Well, just a few months later, in 1519, Da Vinci died here in uh, Amboise. There's been some artistic license with the actual facts of his death. I think you have a painting here that depicts that. Can we go and take a look? Yeah. Thank you. So tell us a bit about this monumental painting. It's a work painted in 1781 by French artist François Guillaume Ménageau, and it depicts Leonardo da Vinci dying in the arms of Francis I. But in fact, it's a lie. For the longest time, art historians put across a version of events. But actually, we know that on the day in question, May 2nd, 1519, the king was not in Amboise at all but in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. So actually, it's a narrative that was constructed for posterity, but it's pure fiction. A fake news of the time. Yes, it's a form of fake news. <laughs> Thank you very much, jean luc You're welcome. Well, the king may not actually have been present at the moment of da Vinci's death, but while his prized artist was still alive, he certainly kept him close to home, just 400 metres away in a stunning building known at the time as the Château de Clou, and since renamed the Clos Lucé. Well, we're now in the Clos Lucé, where some of da Vinci's works have been brought to life here in these gardens. And I'm here to meet with the site's president, François Saint-Brice, hello. Hello, nice to meet you. Thank you very much for welcoming us here. Uh, could you start by giving us a sense of da Vinci's daily life here in the Clos Lucé? Da Vinci's day-to-day -day life was very simple and well-ordered, organised around work in his artist's studio in the mornings, and then a vegetarian lunch prepared by his French cook, Mathurin, before an early night. Well, let's go and see uh, the Florentine studio that he recreated, I understand, uh, right here in the Clos Lucé. That's right, we've restored the workshop in the style of a Renaissance Bottega, those bustling Florentine art studios where apprentices, disciples and admirers would crowd around the master. So tell us a little bit uh, about the work that da Vinci uh, produced here in France. So this would have been da Vinci's workshop, which you have to imagine with that busy Bottega atmosphere. At this table, apprentices would prepare the pigments, for example, lapis lazuli, that was brought over from Afghanistan and ground to a powder. And here we have two of his masterpieces, his Saint John the Baptist, and of course behind us Saint Anne, a work that's seen as his spiritual legacy. Three generations, Jesus, Mary and Anne, set within a triangular perspective. It's a work he started in 1510 and that he never stopped perfecting, including here at the Clos Lucé. And when he died, he still hadn't put the final touches to it. And you have other traces of his work here. Yes, here we've recreated Leonardo's work table. Here we have the drawings he produced during his time here in France, between 1516 and 1519. And we know that because he called upon French stationers for his watermark paper, so we were able to trace it back. On the left there, you have his sketches for the castle of Romorantin, a project dear to King Francis, who wanted to build a new type of ideal city, a new Rome. And then beside that, we have his sketches of costume designs for carnivals. Leonardo had become the master of special effects. He was the George Lucas of the Quattrocento. And then finally, we have these drawings of dancing girls, and he catches their movement beautifully. Although you notice his pencil stroke is getting thicker. In fact, that's Leonardo's last drawing, which is now kept in the Academia Gallery of Venice. Da Vinci always had his beloved cats on the table beside him. And here you can see his sketches turning them into dragons, a perfect example of Leonardo's inventive visionary style.
So this is the room where Leonardo da Vinci passed away. Uh, and to this day, a number of French people view him perhaps as one of their own. Uh, what happened to the works of art that he arrived with in France three years earlier and the body of work he produced here? The trove of manuscripts he'd brought with him to France were left to his favorite disciple, Francesco Melzi. His leather trim coat was bequeathed to his French cook, Mathurin, who'd faithfully concocted his vegetarian meals, an oddity at the time. And finally, his three most famous masterpieces, the Mona Lisa, Saint John the Baptist and Saint Anne, were all subsequently bought by King Francis I and displayed in the royal residence of Fontainebleau before travelling to the Louvre in 1784. Which is where our audience uh, can view them today. Thank you very much, François Saint-Brice, for having shown us around the Clos Lucet. Merci beaucoup. As his dying wish, da Vinci asked to be buried at Amboise Castle, an honor King Francis saw as cementing the two men's relationship for posterity. And so the artist was interred at the spot now marked by this statue. Well, after a long period during which France lost interest in the Renaissance, the remains of Leonardo da Vinci were retrieved from the grounds of the Chateau of Amboise and buried in its little chapel here in 1863. And it's in the artist's final resting place that we leave this edition. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24.